please. Anyway, so um, yeah, the, the, the topic is um, a little bit ironic. Um, all your control groups are belong to us. Um, I'm pretty sure that some of you at least followed the discussions. What what uh, what uh, happened there in the secret territory? By the way, is Tijun here? He's not here, right? Um, so what what happens in the C-group territory? That the C-group um, have been around for quite some time in the Linux world. Um, let's say they were no, never really loved the way they were. Um, and they n never really had a maintainer that was trying to, to, to make them nice. We have that now um, in Tijun, and uh, he tries to clean up uh, much of the interface of it and the internals and sp uh, especially. Um, so uh, we have been uh, uh, sitting down with Tijun for quite some time regarding what this all means for the user space side. Um, so um, what he basically always wanted from, from us is that instead of having everybody um, uh, write to the C group FS and not know much about each other, um, he would much rather prefer um, that there would be one process that arbitrates everything and everybody talks to, to, to that one uh, process basically and that makes sure that everything ha happens in the right order. There, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, um, yeah, for, for us this meant basically that um, Systemd would become the one and only uh, writer to the cgroup file system. And so that instead of applications talking directly to cgroupfs, everybody would talk to, to Systemd instead. Um, this, like, like uh, when we started out using cgroups and, and Systemd, we, we always assumed it was a, a shared resource. Um, with this change, it's no longer, right? It's a private resource that Systemd owns. Um, we, we, we tried to be, like, we, we actually put together a, a document in the, in the Systemd wiki um, that uh, before that, that was called the, the PUX um, C groups document, where we basically wrote down how people should behave in C group tree so that they don't step on each other's toes. From our perspective, that appeared to be sufficient, but Tijun um, explained to us that actually, I mean, he, he really, really hated the PUX um, uh, C groups document because it kind of documented the wrong thing, right? He didn't want to have people cooperate in the tree, he wanted one user space component making um, sure that everything works. Um, Anyway, so the question is, why do we actually need one user space component? Um, I wish actually, I wish Tijun was here because he could probably add a couple of things to the discussion. But um, yeah, so C group FS, um, um, it's like, as it was traditionally done is that you can have your own subdirectory where you can do whatever you want and then everybody else can have a different subdirectory and um, the idea was basically that nobody steps on each other's toes. But this, the fact is that it's not like that. Um, uh, there needs to be some way how changes can actually be propagated between, between uh, different entities in the, in the tree. For example, um, um, if you have uh, in, in systemd um, a couple of services, right, and then you enable um, the CPU controller for, for one of those services, um, then this has the effect that suddenly all the processes of that services are um, scheduled as one unit, basically. If you do not add everybody else who's uh, all the other services on the same level also to their own C groups. This has the negative effects that suddenly simply because you turn on the CPU controller for one of the services, that one would get a lot less um, CPU time than any, everybody else because everybody else would still be accounted per process. But that one would only be accounted as one single entity. So um, what needs to happen in user space there is basically that on every level of the C group tree, you have propagation, not only upwards the tree so that every unit and all the, the, the C group that the unit is in get uh, the CPU schedule enabled, but you also have uh, to have propagation to the side, like to the siblings. So um, you basically, what you need there to, to do this is uh, um, C group management properly and make sure that everything works the way it should, you need to propagate down the tree, like to the root, and you need to uh, propagate to your siblings, um, to, so to the side. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of other things that are like, like complex with the way um, C groups um, work. Like for example, there are a couple of attributes that are too dangerous for people to access um, because they, they, they have effects on, on other things. There are a couple of attributes that are not um, sanely uh, initializable um, for in a generic way. Like for example, the real-time budget because it's taken out of a, of a, a total pool of time, there's no way how a service could actually make use of that in a sensible way, because um, if it would do so, it would kind of block everybody else from using um, the real-time budget entirely. Um, and there are a couple of other things like that. So the, 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 the general summary of that is that many of the um, control group attributes are way too low level, 
and um, Tijun and the other C group maintainers really wouldn't like user space to, to uh, um, fiddle with that. It's like basically um, much of that is shows like gives you really tight controls. For example, on CPU schedule, I mean, can, if you configure something in a weird way, you can make actually the machine become get to a standstill. That's a question. That, that, that's what I was just explaining with the CPU schedule. The thing is, like, if you enable, like, I can try to repeat that. Like, um, if you have this tree and you have a couple of services somewhere in that tree, right, and then you enable the CPU um, controller for one of those services, then you need to enable it also for all the services on the same level. Because otherwise, um, let's say if the services have a very uneven amount of, of, of processes, previously, before you enabled it, every process would get the same, roughly the same amount of CPU. But suddenly, if you enabled it for one and not for the others, then that one um, service with maybe it has a thousand pro uh, processes will suddenly be get scheduled only as one entity, so it will get as much CPU as individually everybody, uh, every el everybody else's um, property. Uh, process, right? So this is like where you have to, to propagate it to the, to the siblings as well. If you turn it for one, you need to turn it for all its siblings and all the parents. You have to rebalance the management, even for people who don't know that they need to be managed. Just because they are on the same level of the tree, they need to be managed because one of them gets managed. And this is something that, can, that would, would need like coordination between different like people owning the, the directory at the same level. So it's much easier to have one central instance do the rebalancing and like coming in with abstract <laughs> questions or set settings and not like asking everybody to adjust itself because that doesn't work. So it does sound like you're saying that there is a, a certain right policy that when you have a C group, you ask to for one unit to the property of the siblings and that that yes, is a so, single policy yeah. that you're allowed to apply. So. so I guess my question is why should that exist in user spaces that are well, because um, um, the thing is, like, the, these units the system maintains, right, they're not always visible to the kernel, right? right? If, if, if they, you don't want resource management for one service, it's not a kernel object because the kernel doesn't even know about that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, so, so what systemd does was uh, um, is, is it has a, this network of, of uh, different units where it actually knows the dependencies between them, right? You, you get automatic dependencies like you know what your father is, basically the slices thing that, that uh, systemd knows, and uh, you know what your siblings are, and so you can actually propagate that through the, through the network. But yeah, anyway, I, I really wish Tijun would be here, but... Um, I don't, I didn't know. So I think every process like you create a CPU, speak group at one level, every process should be somewhere in some sense. No, the thing is if you, if you use it in one thing, you have to use it in all the things at the same level. And, but all the things at the same level might be owned by very different parts of the system, and you, have, you would have to coordinate between them. And this is a problem. It's not a problem if you have a very custom, this is a general purpose distribution setup. If you have a very custom fine-tuned setup, you can do everything on your own. And this is not a problem, but the problem is you install like three servers or three demons for something, and one enables something, and you have to propagate the same changes to all the other things which don't know anything about C-groups. So this is a problem you cannot solve in a general purpose distribution environment. If you like run your robot and do something, you just do whatever you need to do. But in the general purpose history, there's no way to coordinate stuff between different packages that install stuff. And this is what we try to solve here. So, um, I mean, to, to summarize that what systemd does, um, or what doesn't exist otherwise, is basically that you have this network of units and that you have an execution queue how you can, can, can apply these things. Because actually, um, you need to create the C groups in the right order. You need to apply um, the settings in the right order. And only then, for example, add the processes to that. So um, yeah, basically, what you need is a network of things where you can propagate things between. And you need to, you need to execute then, then operations on them bit by bit. And then propagate this in the right order and execute yeah, after it finished, and so on and so on. Um, systemd is basically that. What's that? Like, for example, here's an example. Um, you, you, let's talk about the block I.O. stuff, right? The block I.O. stuff, you, for, for example, can set a weight. Like, for, for a C group, you can set a weight um, for a device, right? Or you can say uh, the bandwidth on a specific device that the C group gets. Um, for, the, for the device, you need to pass in a major and minor, right? So the major and minor is, uh, is uh, nowadays pretty much dynamic. 
and you need to wait before the device uh, that the device actually shows up before you can echo that in there because if it hasn't shown up you don't know the measure of minor of it right so you need an execution and then it's actually capable of of reacting to to all the events that 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 happen in the boot up of system so that the devices all appear you can figure out the major minor number then you can queue that in and then you can queue uh, continue and create the subtrees um, of everything so so yeah, you need this execution engine to basically can generate and uh, can, can react on what happens in the system. And a lot of things that are external to the actual C group problem actually influence how you have to write things into the C group tree. And then again, you always have to propagate it again. So you might actually, if you then are capable of, of finally writing the block IO there as Tejun finally, wonderful. Um, so if you then finally are capable of writing that attribute, you need to, to, to propagate the, these changes properly, uh, possibly further up the tree again into the siblings. So right now, uh, when you log the journal, it uses a C group file system on the base OS to uh, determine what unit something's coming from for the trusted fields. Well, that, uh, you, you were mentioning before, I mean, not this session, that that's not a really fast operation. Will journal performance for logging improve substantially with um, system D having uh, exclusive control over the hierarchy? No. no. Got unrelated. I mean, previously, what the journal did um, to figure out, like, from which service a specific log message was, was go to ProcFS. And uh, that's kind of going to stay that way, except that we can optimize a little bit. But this specific thing, if, if it's private, our private property, or if it's shared by everybody, doesn't have an influence on that specific question. This is really more about a general purpose setup where you have competing demons running that need to be managed by something. So. But um, continuing, so we have this propagation thing. We have this thing that the attributes are not safe. Um, we need this um, thing that, that um, like, because delegation is not, not possible simply because everything might have to propagate to something else, you need this, this uh, daemon that actually has, a, has an idea of the big picture, right? That knows wh whatever is happening there. If, if libvirt is doing something, it needs to know that. If system is doing something on its own, it needs to know that. If, I don't know, LogMD is doing something, needs to know that. If anybody else does something, like for example, Apache create a, it wants to create a, a C group for each virtual host, it needs to know about that. So you need this unifying thing. Um, and for us, that's systemd. Um, what's the next thing? Another thing why we believe this should be in, in systemd is, is, is simply to make it friendly to the administrator, because resource management, regardless um, what you uh, change the resources off, it should have ultimately the same UIs, uh, we believe, right? Because, for example, you have for a customer, you give him a couple of services to run, a couple of containers to run, a couple of uh, KVM machines to run. Ultimately, we believe this all should be configurable in the same way regarding resource management, especially since many of the settings you make there have implications on all the other stuff you do there. So we believe it's a good thing if uh, the delegation doesn't happen, but everything is unified um, via the sing single thing so that you can actually expose a unified interface to the administrator and make everything understandable in that area. Um, then uh, something that systemd does that uh, a low-level C group FS doesn't do is provide friendly access to the attributes. Like, for example, I already mentioned that for the block I.O. stuff that um, you handle a deal a lot with major minor um, stuff. The major minor is completely um, um, like non-deterministic these days. So it is much more friendly to the administrator to um, be able to write actually the device node in there and then has the system automatically resolve that at the right time and things like that. Um, goes further than that, like if you, if you write, for example, the memory lib into C group FS, you have to do that in bytes. Um, something superficial that, that system makes easier for you that allows you to write something down with the suffixes M, K, and G for, yeah, the obvious gigabytes and megabytes and kilobytes and so on. So it's a question about um, a yeah, very obvious thing is hot plug in general. So if you connect new devices, install a new service, whatever, you need to do dynamic reconfiguration of everything on the system. And this is something that needs to be done by something, not by all the individual pieces you have installed or by the device you plugged in. So if you want to support hot plug, you have to have some centralized engine that knows about the, about the entire state of the system. And if you like enable a new C group controller or whatever, you have to rebalance the entire tree according to that setting. And this is something that cannot be done in a cooperative way between demons. Oh, I, I see an argument for rebalancing everything on two levels. I, I don't see an argument there for um, walking down the tree. For walking up the tree, I mean, you cannot have a C group that is member, a member of, of, of the CPU controller, but not having all its parents to be, be known to the CPU controller. 
right? I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, no? So if you use something down the tree, it has to be in the root, too. And of course, and because of the rule that always the siblings always, um, like for some controllers at least, need to be um, part of that thing as well, you have this rule that you go up the tree, have to enable it for all the siblings, and you go one step further up the tree, you enable it for all the siblings, and so on until you reach the root. Right? Okay. And of course, for every single one of that, that you need to then think about hot plug and all the devices coming and going, and so you need to dynamically do that. You, you're, if, if, you, if you do something down the tree, you have to propagate up to the root with the stuff. You cannot enable something down in the tree. It's not like a mount you do in a file system in some subdirectory. You have, if you do something in a secret tree, you have to propagate up to the front. You're not answering the question. Oh. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> what did you ask? <laughs> So, so think of this. So think of this. You have libvirt, and you have um, I don't know um, uh, system the and spawn tool, right? They they are on the same level, right? They got uh, their own delegated thing in the classic model, right? So now you turn on CPU management for libvirt. Now the and spawn delegated thing needs to enable it as well. I'm sorry. Anyway, the summary is basically that the thing is, is, is dynamic and when something changes, be it uh, external events because you start something new, be it an external event because some new hardware comes available, then you need to rethink the entire thing and apply new, new changes to it and you need to be able to propagate that because some, sometimes these, these siblings, if you enable in one, needs to end up in the second as well. If you don't have a block device, a certain block device, you wouldn't be able to configure weight or I/O limits to that device. But you know, when a new device is plugged, the kernel doesn't really know what it is. I mean, the policy is in user space, right? And then the user space would need to apply, you know, whatever I/O limits according to different C groups to that new device. However, that is identified. It can be identified identified by its hardware ID, you know, its label, whatever. Right, so I mean that part really doesn't Connor doesn't really have any information about, and 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 you know that will be one example where like uh, uh, you know user then agent which can recognize hot plug event, identify the device and apply rules according to its policies. <coughs> So, um, well, I mean, like, so the, the the example I used probably is not the right one for that question because because I mean, block I/O device device is not does not live in hierarchy. You know, rules for the device lives in hierarchy, right? And I think maybe what you're asking is. Um, why, why like the whole tree needs rebalancing when something new happens? Is that your question? I'm not really following your question. So, this is probably the deeper question. Is, so, it makes sense to me because it's just slow policy to get all, all to control all the groups group that are set at one level or higher. Uh, but for delegated groups, uh, you know, I don't know. Except for kernel bugs. Okay. Um, I, I have to use the arm to use. Okay. I, I don't see uh, why it needs to be 
oh, you mean why, why the whole hierarchy, like multiple depths of it should be controlled by a single agent? Yeah. Basically, if you have a single group. Well, I mean, we actually have an excellent example of that. Um, like maybe you can help me screw up CPU shares. In the current system yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what we we're talking of, like this the CPU share example, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can can only repeat the same example that I already repeated twice, right? The thing is that that the moment you enable the CPU, like 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 think about a couple of servers that are on the same level, right? Every one of them, like one of them has one process, the next one has a hundred processes, and the third one has a thousand processes, right? So if you if you do not use CPU scheduling, uh, like CPU the CPU controller for any of them. Then the first one will accumulate and get as well one unit of time. The next one will get 100 times more than that, and the third one a thousand times more than the original one. So now you enable the CPU scheduler, um, the CPU um, controller for one of them, right? Let's, for example, for the for the rightmost, right? Previously, you got a thousand times more than the than the first one, but suddenly we're going to get exactly the the same amount of it. Right, and that's still okay. But uh, in the middle, right, um, like if you compare it to the one that, that, that has a hundred processes, then suddenly we'll only get hundreds of the middle one. Right, simply by, by naming it for one of them, suddenly the, the, the scheduling um, benefit or, 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 or uh, malus that it gets is, is, is drastically altered. Simply because suddenly something that is a thousand processes, like thousand scheduling units, becomes one. Right, so the, the, the only fair thing you can do is either you leave it out entirely and say everything is scheduled per process, or on the same level, you say um, everything gets, process, uh, gets scheduled basically per service, so that everything gets a third of the um, um, available amount of CPU, right? So I guess the takeaway is that the, configuration, the configuration, co configurations are not completely independent between peers, or so, I mean, it's all codependent. There are aspects which are codependent, so um, you cannot really enable like on this single node and get away with it. So you have to kind of like worry about how, what the impacts it has on its peers. So that's where the you know, central control is necessary because otherwise you, you, know, like you, do, you think that you are doing something which is independent, but you end up affecting your peers yep. in a way which is not desirable or expected. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that um, the thing is, well, I mean, people think that like doing it in kernel would be easier um, or, I don't know, more possible, reliable, whatever. But um, that, I mean, usually is, I mean, that is the case for many things, but that is not necessarily the case in, for this one because a lot of this is a policy um, decisions. And the thing with kernel mechanism is that you cannot really enforce like certain type of policies on its users. So what the kernel has to provide is a generating mechanism to allow implementing policies. And, and here for resource management, the policy decisions are like such an integral part of the whole thing so that um, if we want to do that all in kernel proper, we would end up with a lot of uh, policy decision making in the kernel, which it needs to be communicated from user space, depending on its configuration. So I think I think it actually is a more reasonable design to provide a, a basic um, um, mecha not mechanical but basic mechanism to enforce those limits, which can be configured by a policy decision maker in the user space. I think that's a more sensible uh, split of roles because. We just have a lot more latitude and a lot more information and context in user space in that regard uh, compared to kernel. And transmitting all that information to kernel is just a gigantic mess. So.
Is this one actually works? Oh, it works. Um, okay, so, so another reason why system we should be um, um, uh, the, the entity in the system um, taking control of C groups is simply because in most cases, like for the uh, vast majority of use cases, um, it is actually the services that you want to set resource limits for, right? Like you want to set resource limits on, on, on Apache or MySQL or whatever else you want to set them on, and that is um, in for, for a large degree just that. I mean, it's not the only use case, of course. You might want to have resource limits on, on particular combinations of things for customers and these kinds of things. But in general, for many, many use cases, it, it's completely sufficient if you have resource management of, of, of services. Um, and another thing is, we actually believe that it makes a lot of sense to, to, to expose a lot of the C group stuff by default um, uh, on the system in a, in a default configuration so that the administrator doesn't even have to think about that. For example, one of these things is, um, we believe it makes a lot of sense that if five users log in, that um, all of them get um, an equal part of the viable resources, right? Like, for example, the CPU time. Um, so that um, it's not possible that one user logs in, creates a thousand processes, the other one logs in, creates three processes, and then one of them gets 333 times more CPU time just because he created more processes. So um, it is our intention there to ship with, a, with the same default of resource management just that, that works for everybody. Um, this is not, not only applies to login sessions, it applies to quite a few other things. For example, MySQL tends to have a relatively small number of processes and threads. On the other hand, Apache has a, has a ridiculously large number of worker processes and CGI process forked off that and, and these kind of things. So in a, in a good uh, um, web server setup, it might make a lot of sense to, by default, um, um, make sure that Apache and MySQL get the same amount of CPU if, if CPU is scarce, um, simply to even out things. So yeah, it, we believe it should be in system simply because that's where you can apply good default policy, and that's where we believe that in most cases people actually want to apply the policy if they um, apply their own. Um, so uh, um, to talking about in general, even though system D in our eyes should be the one um, that controls the C group tree, um, of course, there is no dependency from the kernel on systemd or anything like that. It just means that on systemd systems, um, systemd is the one who is in control of, of the C group tree. If you run something different, you can take, take possession of the C group tree. I think from the kernel perspective, all that uh, matters is that in user space, there's one um, uh, uh, component that takes control of it and not many. And the, who that is doesn't matter to the kernel at all. Um, so um, I figure that uh, people um, uh, usually come up with a question that already came up here a little bit. Why can't this be external of systemd, this kind of management? I already tried to answer it a little bit with the fact that what we need here for the C group stuff, for the propagation, for the scheduling, is exactly what systemd is, right? Systemd manages these units, uh, units and uh, um, uh, has the dependency network between them, and systemd executes these units at specific times. This is exactly the same problem as you use for the C group stuff. I mean, we didn't design it that way. This is something that we noticed when we um, finally discussed this problem, that actually, oh my god, the systemd model is exactly the thing that we need there. Um, but um, yeah, so, so if you rip that out of systemd, which you of course can do, then you end up with something that is pretty close to systemd again, because you need this network um, of units again, and a scheduler, and these kind of things. Right? Another reason why we believe this should be in systemd itself is simply overhead. Like if you have two dams that can constantly communicate, you spend a lot of time serializing everything in between of them. Um, given that usually um, C group management on the kernel side is actually pretty easy, you just do an mkdir to create a C group and a, write something to a file to add a PID to it. It's ridiculous, always involving the IPC stuff. Also, it creates a lot of deadlock uh, style um, situation because you end up with something where systemd, like PID1, when it wants to start a service, it needs to set up a C group for that, needs to talk to an external service for that, and that external service, and of course, um, would have been started by systemd. So you have this, this cyclic dependency where one service is managed by systemd, but also provides services to systemd, which is something we really would like to avoid because then you have deadlocks, like, because, um, yeah, if systemd wants that from that service, that service is not there, so the system needs to start it, but it's still waiting for that request to finish, then you have the deadlock, right? It's generally something that, that, um, I mean, for example, you, you can even uh, bring that to the top, like if you, you say, okay, every service on the system should get its own C group in this CPU hierarchy, and if you configure that, what do you do with the 
that weird daemon that actually manages the C-group hierarchy because then you would have to talk to the daemon to start the daemon, which doesn't make any sense. Anyway, long story short, this creates all these kind of um, cyclic fancy problems, deadlock problems that we just don't want to deal with. I mean, I'm not saying that they wouldn't be individually work aroundable. I'm just saying that it's just a mess to deal with if we don't want to do that. What's that? In the named hierarchy, so it's just a C group without a controller. It's where it control where it takes track of the process that it started. Uh, system D is currently it's so um, I already mentioned that that we we believe that System D is the right place to do this so that we can have a good default hierarchy. So by default, there are basically um, three um, uh, highest level her, uh, uh, hierarchies. One is called System Slice. Like we we have a, a concept called slices, which. <coughs> Go into detail, but anyway, um, there's system dot slice, there's user dot slice, and there's machine dot slice. In system dot slice, you find all the system services, including system itself. In user dot slice, you find all the user that they log in sessions, and in machine dot slice, you find all the virtual machines and containers. Um, so this is basically what I was um, talking about um, regarding the de default setup. We believe that that in many cases is probably already enough for people. Um, of course, if they want to have something more complex, like for example, one one petition for each um, customer or something like that, they can depart from that. But we believe it makes a ton of sense to have this as a default, and, and that's what the default is. Um, and it's again, it's about a general purpose system. I mean, if you do something custom, you don't have to follow any of these rules system is doing. It's just that we have to work with third party stuff and stuff that gets on the system and up. So when we start up, we dump basically the configuration from the disk into the kernel. And we have to do this all the time. Every time something changes, we have to recalculate all that stuff and apply it to the kernel. Because the kernel cannot know what it means that a disk showed up or that whatever, some new package got installed and something starts and so on get stopped. So we have to apply this configuration to the kernel. We have to dump the stuff we know into the kernel at every time something changes. So have you thought about how you're going to automatically figure out how much uh, you know, the uh, system.slice might take versus user.slice? In particular, for things like MySQL, where it's really doing work on behalf of the user, depending on what services are started up, you may want a very different percentage so you mean the user triggers something on the system that, and you, you, you think about accounting the stuff that the user has triggered? Well, it's not that way. It's, it's a fair share. So, if, so currently... The, the thing, the thing is that the entire CPU stuff only gets active if people compare up to the 100%. It's, there is no way telling it should only take 10%. If, nobody, if the box is idle, the user can take 100%. But as soon as start, stuff starts competing, we schedule the stuff down. This is the... So, yes. So, um, I mean, there are different um, uh, uh, level uh, limits that you can set. Like for CPU stuff, it's pretty easy because you can basically assign a weight to everything, and then everything gets distributed evenly. And um, so, so what we do currently as a default is basically that system dot slice, user dot slice, machine dot slice, each get a third of the CPU. But uh, that only matters really if the machine is really under full load, right? If if it's not, then then everybody can have what he wants. But this is basically, of course, um, we will not be able to cover with our default all the use cases. Absolutely not. But we think this is a very sensible result because then at least you cannot, like the user cannot really um, um, starve the, the system to death anymore by default. And that is already a pretty good, good thing. Of course, the system can still um, starve each other, like other components of a system. But I mean, you cannot protect for everything. But I think it's a really a big advantage already if all the users get an even amount, if all the services get an even, even amount, and if all the services together against the users together get an even amount of CPU under load.
No, that actually, like, like so, so uh, all the system servers will get individ individual C group by default. We don't enable that currently for, for the user stuff that uh, was, was talking of. This currently disabled by default, but you can enable it by default. The reason for that is um, that the real time budget, um, like, if you enable CPU for a specific service, then you have to specify a real time budget, because if you don't, then the service will not get, uh, like, the, the, the group will not get any real time privileges. And that's annoying because um, Pulse Audio, for example, the audio server actually wants real time privileges. Privileges, which basically means if we would add um, the user sessions to an individual C group each, then we wouldn't know how to configure that budget because it comes out of an absolute pool. And so we wouldn't know, like if we say, um, like you get a half of a CPU, then that actually is a fixed limit. And then you could only have another, one other user lock in until the, the entire thing is, so, yeah. Anyway, so the story is basically because we want Pulse Audio to get um, real time, we just opt out of that. This is something that the kernel people need to fix for us, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, but for the services, this is enabled by default. Are there other So, yeah, so uh, this, is, this is another topic. Um, Systemd will provide, uh, or currently already provides, um, a couple of interfaces how you can uh, talk to each other. Um, uh, to talk to it and, and, and request groups to be created, basically, and, 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 and set attributes for it. It's all exposed via Dbus. Um, and there's basically... Everything is exposed as a system unit, and you can say, like, let's say you have something like a child process or a group of child processes that you want to run in a specific C group and then reset resource limits on it. The way you do it, basically, you go to, to systemd via the bus and say, I want a, a, um, a, a scope unit. That's how we call it, basically. And these are the processes that should be in it, and these are the default attributes um, that should be set for it, like this, like CPU shares and all the kind of things. And then the system will do that. It will show up very similar to a service in the system, like, for example, with system control, it will list it, if you know system control. And with system control, the admin can even change the, the attributes of that group like it could for any other normal service. So it feels very natural, like, like, like a real service, basically. Um, that API is unfortunately completely doc documented yet. Um, it is relatively complete. Um, we do not expose all the attributes that are available via cgroup fs. That usually has the reason that the kernel guys, um, speaking Tijun, is not sure that they actually should be exposed to user space. Um, basically, everything that we expose right now as attributes, which is like the obvious things like CPU shares, block IO, weights, and these kind of things, are safe enough so that they're going to stay around for good and they can be used. But there are a couple of uh, omissions that people will notice. Like, for example, the CPU set stuff is currently not exposed because it's, it's, it's on the kernel side. Yeah, basically, Tijun um, wants to rework that all, and, and the, the API will probably look very different in the, in the future. But the idea is basically what we expose in systemd is the stuff that Tijun told us is safe. And we will do it as soon as Tijun tell, tells us that it is safe. <laughs> so you can basically blame Tijun if there's something missing, not us. The configuration would change irreversibly as the hardware configuration changes. So if you offline the CPU, and if you bring it back online, the CPU set configuration would have changed irreversibly. And the only way you can track it is either reading it back from um, CSFS again, or somehow try to match its tra state transition in user space, which it doesn't make any sense. Um, so like things like that, so we have some fundamental problems in, in some of our controller implementations, um, which doesn't really make sense in terms of interface. So um, those things are um, now developing V2 of uh, their interfaces. So um, as soon as they are ready, I think um, they're going to get exposed um, through you know, higher level API. So there's a reason why I'm trying to hold back like, new users of the existing interface. Um, yeah, on mailing list, yeah. Um, it's usually the secret mailing list and LKML. I usually CC both mailing lists. Um, so I mean, if you if you try to find the uh, conversation conversation between me and Lee Zefan, and it's mostly about CPU sets.
Turn on. Um, so um, this is an inherently a systemd API, and it's unlikely to change simply because it exposed so much of the, the, the basic uh, design ideas of systemd regarding units and these kind of things. So um, if uh, you come to us and say, what should I do with my application if I want to make it run on Ubuntu and, and, uh, and uh, Fedora, Red Hat, RHEL, whatever, um, the same way, then I cannot really give you an answer that, that will make you happy because basically, I mean, the Ubuntu guys don't have anything in that area right now that I was aware of, so they have to figure out their, their stuff. And if they, if they come up with something, it's probably not going to be in any way like the stuff that Systemd does. So um, basically, in that case, I can only defer you to, if you care about Ubuntu, to ask the Ubuntu people about what they are going to do. It's unfortunate, of course, but um, I mean, yeah, the easiest way out would, of course, if they would adopt Systemd, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, so to give a little bit of outlook on the future of these things, in the short-term future, you can still have your delegated subtree, but of course, um, you should be very, very careful and you should know that it's not safe. In the middle-term future, you um, will have to ask Systemd to create the C group for you, but you're still allowed to, to change a couple of attributes uh, as free will um, simply by accessing C group FS. And in the long term future, all of that will go away, and the only way to access it is via the Systemd bus APIs. Um, something that is, uh, um, there's a question. It's the next thing. Like, I mean, there's, it's partly there. It's, it's just you need to write that down, all this stuff. Um, there's something else to mention is that uh, Systemd abstracts away the changes that Tijun is doing. I'm not sure if you, if you followed the, the C group changes on the kernel side. There's the same behavior flag now that Tijun is working on. Um, with uh, that flag set, basically, C group FS starts to behave very differently, and all the different hierarchies are gone, and there's only one hierarchy left. Um, with the stuff that we expose in Systemd, we will hide that difference away, right? Um, so all the features that we expose there, all the settings that we expose there will work now on the traditional split setup, and then later on on the same default uh, uh, behavior uh, setup that will work the same way, and you will not have to notice it if you only use the Systemd APIs. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess that's all that we have on this topic. Um, uh, we probably should next, switch to the next topic, but um, let's have some more questions, like three more questions or so at this time, if there are any. But uh, that doesn't have anything to see groups. We'll, we'll talk a little bit. That doesn't. So you, so you start system D in a slice, well, in a C group versus the where it can't talk directly to the C group. That's the, the new world of work. How does that work? Oh, that, that's thing. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the, 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 what's uh, first of all important to us is that that uh, the, the things that are in control of system uh, like in the container and outside of the container, that's kind of the thing that matters to us, right? So either the container uses upstart in something and then it doesn't use C groups or anything at all, or it system that is inside of it. So you have, while you will not have um, a PID one everywhere um, in control, you at least have systemd always in control. But the other thing is um, uh, um, it will have only a subset of the functionality available as the, as the um, root system will have. So basically, I mean, we have been discussing that with Tijun, there's nothing nailed down, but what I would like to see basically is that there are attributes which are declared safe enough so that, that uh, um, like uh, um, systemd in a container can use it and others um, that are only available to the host system. But uh, um, yeah, basically this means that you have more settings to, to um, set the resource limits on a container than you will have inside of the container for, for, for further services down there. So uh, let's say you're running um, systemd in an LXC container um, and you're starting services there. Is systemd within that container able to set the C groups for those services? Yeah, that's what I was basically saying. That what what matters in the in the first term is that systemd is running inside of the container and outside of the container, and then we can trust it enough to give it um, a little bit of access so that it can create the C groups. But as mentioned, you will not get like the systemd inside of the container will not get the same resource management um, functionality than the outside. But as mentioned, this is the still in, in flux basically. Like I, I would like that if if if. Uh, if uh, C groups would have a new capability for that, how we can control that so that the containers don't get the capability and the, and the root system does get it, but yeah. So, so that the containers would not have the capability to set C groups? They will have C groups, but not with the resource limits, um, at least not to the same level as the host. And uh, do these get set by interfacing with the base system, system D, to set the C groups then? That's one option we don't know now. Okay. 
So, so in the beginning, it will basically just get access to the to the to the C group file system, right? And it can create its own subgroups. But because there is no no uh, no resource management stuff, then it doesn't need to be propagation, right? So um, that, that's that's our cheap way out of that because we just say, okay, there's a cutoff point basically. Um, so basically, that means that containers can use it for grouping and for for getting notifications when services run empty, but not for resource management itself. Um, anyway, further questions at this point? Nope. So then I guess we switch to the next topic, which is? Okay, lightweight containers with NSpawn. Um, this is, is supposed to be only very quick, and I should demo that with my laptop. And as we already did that earlier, it didn't like my, where's my, wasn't there, things set up there. Um, is it not there? Oh, there it is. Okay. So um, when we did the earlier five-second boot demo, we already had the problem with this um, HDMI converter being awful, and it still is awful. But um, we'll try it anyway. So in, in the, sometimes the, the uh, screen might go blank. I kindly ask you, OK, this is bullshit. To uh, then ignore that. So, um, anyway, let me talk before I show the demo um, first a little bit about Systemd Enspawn. Systemd Enspawn is a little tool that we wrote that is um, shipped as part of Systemd. Um, it's basically, uh, it uses the same functionality of the kernel that LXC uses, like, like namespaces and like C groups and these kind of things, um, to start up a, uh, up a small container. We basically wrote it, um, first of all, to test system itself, um, and because it's a lot easier to use than, than LXC is usually, because you basically can just put together a little command line and boot up your, your, your um, Linux that is installed in a subdirectory and will just work. So. Um, to make that clear, systemd nspawn is not supposed to be anything like LXC or libvirt LXC. Um, nothing that you should run on your server. It's really something that that uh, you should you might be useful. For example, in, in situations like you do mock building of RPMs, you so it's basically for debugging, for building things, for profiling things, and these kind of stuff. Where basically an educated administrator or, or developer sits in front of his computer and just wants to test something. All I wanted to show, like uh, here, is is to make this uh, aware that this tool exists. Um, and how you can use it. It's, it's installed on all the systems that you have. So basically, what I have here is um, I installed uh, Fedora into a subdirectory. And uh, now I can um, simply boot that up. And that's already it. So now you can log in. And then I'm inside of my container. And um, yeah, it looks like a real operating system in there. And I can press Control D, and then I can actually um, power off the container, and I'm back in the in the system around it. So, um, okay, and then when the screen went black, it should turn on itself quickly. Well, I know it's, it's basically the HDMI adapter is, is stupid. Um, anyway, this NSpawn thing is supposed to do the same thing as LXC has mentioned, but without any configuration, right? Like, if you have a have an unmodified Fedora um, in, in, in a in a in a subdirectory, you can just boot it with that. The command line is as trivial as this one. Um, with dash D, you simply specify the path. With dash B, you, say it, you basically say that you actually want to boot it up. If you take away the dash B, what you will get instead, um, OK, this is the bug in the kernel. Let's ignore that. Uh, so if you don't do that, um, like this bug in the kernel will be fixed. So ignore the dash M here for, for a moment. You basically get a shell. It feels a lot like classical change root command it takes, except that you actually have a real container running here. So um, if you type PS, then you see that you're the only one, the only process in the container. Um, we use NSpawn to test a lot of the features that Systemd has um, regarding containers. Um, so uh, NSpawn actually has nice things like you can use socket activation, things like that. It's basically our test case where we implement these things first because it's quick and easy. Systemd NSpawn itself is like a very short program. Um, it used to be like, I don't know, 500 lines of code. It's a little bit uh, larger now, but it's still absolutely trivial in comparison to LXC or anything like that. Um, so we, we, we demoed all these things like socket activated containers with NSpawn all works. And um, nowadays, libvirt LXC can do the same stuff. So it's basically, yeah, the test case where we demo with fancy stuff and then use it later on. Is there any intention on 
supporting uh, SE Linux isolation within Spotify? Um, not really, no. So I, I know that Dan Walsh actually want, wants it to, to, to be used for that, but it's not on, on my list. I really want to, like, I mean, the man page makes this clear, right? Like, if you, if you go to the man page, then uh, the first thing, oops. <laughs> Yeah, um, if you if you go to the, the to the man page, like one of the first things, oops, it says here that it is about um, uh, namespace container for debugging, testing, and building things. Right? It's, it's not for anything else. Like it's not supposed. It actually explicitly says, it tells you also that it's not about security. Right? It's really just about testing something and, and building something. Um, if you if you ever want to deploy something, you should use libvirt.lxc. Don't use Anspawn. But Anspawn is so awesomely easy to use. Um, one of the goals that we have with systemd in the bigger picture is actually that the that, um, systemd operating systems work exactly the same way and boot up cleanly, regardless if you run them on bare metal, on, on, on um, real like KVM virtual machines, and on containers. So we carefully ma made actually sure using systemd and spawn that uh, um, systemd will actually adapt to the fact that it runs in container because containers, in contrast to KVM machines, differ quite a bit from a real operating system. Like, for example, device management is not virtualized in the kernel, so we cannot do the normal UDA thing and so we uh, comment that out and there are a couple of other things that are automatically skipped so that um, system images should just work. So the idea is really that, that you can have one operating system image and then um, like uh, one day you can boot it in a container, the next day you can boot it on bare metal and the third day in a KVM it will actually just work and, and notice automatically where it's running in and make the best out of it. So um, the system the, um, um, uh, test um, system um, like which, which, which you have in the systemd tree, actually puts together an operating system image and um, like minimal, like it pulls a couple of things of the host operating system together with the systemd that you're currently building um, and then is booting that one once in systemd and spawn and once in KVM and does a couple of tests and only if that uh, um, works cleanly we do a new release. So yeah, we ourselves use that not only for debugging and stuff, we actually use it actively for testing things. It's part of our test routine. Again, this is installed on all the um, system to systems if you have one. It's just there and it's tiny and it's awesome and people should totally start using it. But not on a server. Here's Libvirt LXC for that. Um, anyway, questions regarding this wonderful little tool? Like, it uses, it uses, uh, I didn't understand the question. Yeah. Not user namespaces, um, but it, it currently uses PID namespaces, network namespaces, and all the other namespaces, but new, not user namespaces. So yeah, we, we, are, we are Red Hat people. We run the Fedora kernel. It's not on there. We can't use it. So there's one thing that, that uh, might be worth mentioning. Currently, this doesn't work if you have audit enabled in the kernel. You need to disable um, audit in the kernel, um, for example, by passing audit equals zero on the kernel command line. It's supposed to be fixed eventually, like actually, I think there was some work going on, but I don't know what the latest state of that is, so that it will just work on your Fedora system and will just boot up. But, uh yeah, if you manually hack the list of namespaces in and spawn and launch with user namespaces, then it mostly works. Anyway, are there any further questions on Nspawn? Otherwise, we would go to the next topic, which would be Gummy Boot. So our general goal with systemd is to be compatible with the kernel versions from the last two years. We're not compatible with the kernel versions from the last 10 years or something like that. Some people would like that, but we're not. Um, there's likely to be, good, to be some breaks, though, because we're doing the KDBA stuff you might have, you have heard about. And, um, uh, I mean, the C group stuff, we can, we can, there's no need to break compatibility there. I don't see that. I think we will support that smoothly and well keep to our, our goal to, to stay compatible with the last two years of kernels. But uh, the KD bus thing is something where we'll probably say um, on one version then, okay, this one is the version where you have to have KD bus 
and it will be like, yeah, it's basically before that there will be no KD bus, after that there will be only KD bus. And what we then suggest to people if they, if they want to run older kernels is to simply backport KD bus. The nice thing is that KD bus is relatively separate from the rest of the kernel, so it should be relatively easy to, to backport it. Um, any further questions on this, on the um, Ensmond thing or? So otherwise, do you want a mic?